Hi, everybody. My name is Jose. I am uh, staff at Electronic Frontier Foundation, and I may, mainly work with uh, local groups uh, across the country on domestic issues. Um, I may occasionally, we are a free speech organization, among other things, and I may occasionally speak for myself, in which case I'll probably cover up any EFF insignia um, when I say those types of things. Hi, I'm Ron Daniels. I'm an attorney in middle Georgia. I have a, a very general practice and done a, a lot of things including representing government agencies, um, uh, defending indigent clients in uh, superior court and felonies, representing clients in federal criminal cases, uh, to doing consumer protection work. Uh, I will give you my disclaimer is that I am an attorney in Georgia. Uh, you are not my client. I am not giving you legal advice. Uh, and uh, uh, you cannot rely on anything I say as legal advice because you're not my client. If you uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, don't don't go say Ron told me I could go do this. Right. So um, I'm going to give a quick uh, overview of, well, no, nothing I'm going to do is quick. Let's be real. Um, but I'm going to give a little overview of uh, police foundations and then talk um, to some of the issues, especially that uh, EFF pays attention to with regard to them as well as kind of their makeup. Um, and I want to start with kind of a hypothesis, just so you know where I'm coming from, regardless of where you all are coming from. Um, and that's that uh, I come to this with an analysis of police, that modern policing exists to control the working class and poor. Uh, and especially any movements uh, that attempt to organize for those, those communities. So, uh, you know, regardless of that, that, the that hypothesis, um, we can kind of see uh, uh, if it's true a little bit with the question of uh, who the, the police's friends are. Um, so uh, I'm going to start with a little definition that comes from Color Change and Little Sis. They put out a report uh, last year um, in which they uh, defined that this is slightly uh, augmented by myself. Police foundations are private organizations that funnel corporate money into policing, protecting corporate interests, and enabling state-sanctioned violence as tax-deductible tax charitable donations. So um, to get into the history of it a little bit, uh, I, people kind of understand that, that uh, 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 definition. All right. Um, so the first police foundation was the New York City Police Foundation, as far as I know, um, in 1971. And it came actually after uh, the story of Frank Serpico. Serpico went to the New York Times and other uh, publications, uh, called out police corruption. There was the Knapp Commission that started in 1970. Uh, and it started to put a lot more attention on police funds uh, funding because there had been a lot of bribes and, uh, and a lot of corruption in the New York Police Department. So the very next year, a number of business leaders across the city, uh, including real estate firms, uh, a lot of uh, corporate law firms um, and banks, got together and created the New York City Police Foundation. Um, and basically what they started to do was they took ba big donations from large corporations, whether or not they were based in New York City, uh, and then they channeled them into the New York City Police Department through uh, uh, funding projects that the New York City Police Department was either unsure it could get the funding for or even unsure if it was a good project in the first place. They just kind of wanted to get funds in so that they could test pilot programs uh, and uh, not have to go through the uh, democratic process. Um, and that's kind of the, the, the history of police foundations is that uh, before that and outside of police foundations, uh, how do you get funding for, for uh, police uh, surveillance or police technology or pilot programs? Usually you have to go through a budget process. Either that is a part of the overall uh, city police budget process, in which case there are hearings and there is the possibility in city council meetings of public comment, um, or you, uh, you go through specific individual uh, attempts to go, the, the police will go to the city council and say, we w would like this one thing, can you give us $5 million or $500,000 for this project? And again, you have the possibility that city council members who are elected officials could be unelected because they uh, voted for something or voted against something. You have the possibility of, of public comment and people can speak to their outrage. Uh, and you also have uh, a series of other kinds of mechanisms of democratic and uh, accountability and transparency including public records requests. Uh, you have a budget that goes straight out into the public and you can look line by line on that budget often and see you know, what the, the police are spending their money on. Um, and instead, 
you know, the, the New York City Police Foundation was able to take these gifts and then, uh, you know, money from, from big corporations or in some cases their tech, their technology, and then channel it to the, uh, to the New York City Police Department without actually having to go through anything that would be accountable except, of course, tax filings, which maybe you'll talk a little bit more about at some point. But, uh, but you know, the tax filings are a lot more vague. So the New York City Police Department, when it talks through its tax filings, uh, thanks to ProPublica, they put up uh, a series of different cities' uh, police foundations' tax filings. The, the, the New York City Police Department often calls it technology campaigns. So now we don't know what the tech is. We don't know who the contractors are. We don't know. We don't necessarily know anything except who the donors to the foundation were, and uh, you know. Then we can see this in the tax filings, um, and then the police may have a tool or a toy that they no longer. Uh, I see a hand in the back, but um, uh, you know, the, the police may have a tool or a toy that they couldn't get otherwise. Um, how do you feel like you and Let's let's do yeah, Let's go yeah. for a question right yeah. now. In the back. And we, we don't have a real rigid schedule with this. I right. Mean, if, if we have questions, I, feel yeah. free to pop up and ask questions. The only thing I'll ask is you say your name, where you're from, so we can know who you are. Okay. That would be nice. Um, my name is Hydra. I'm from Decatur, Georgia. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I have a question if there was a precedent before the 70s for private entities to fund government organizations, like if a private company wanted to give the sanitation department a bunch of trucks, like was, are there any other examples of other kinds of public services and getting this kind of money? And like what, what, and if not, then like how, I'm just curious how that was able to be in, implemented like that. So, I mean, one of the things we actually were talking about before uh, the panel kicked off up here was that, you know, originally the fire department wasn't even a government uh, entity. It was a private-ran uh, fire prevention and fire stopping force, uh, and you had to pay to be able to have fire protection. Um, so, you know, yeah, there there is a history of these things not necessarily being open and uh, fully transparent in, in government funded um, and and there's also plenty of of times before the 1970s and the police foundations getting started that you would see um, either through you know I talked about last night civil asset forfeiture sometimes they, they would get assets that way that they would would use but you could also in at any time donate property to a government entity if they were willing to accept it um, and particularly in Georgia I mean it, you can donate land to a government entity for a tax write-off uh, and it's been that way, I believe, since the 1800s under Georgia's laws. So you, you could donate vehicles and things like that. Um, you, you couldn't give them straight cash, um, which is what police foundations can do, um, but not always. I mean, sometimes they buy the tech or they buy the equipment. Uh, and, and I would add also that, um, you know, there is ob obviously also a history of police deputizing uh, groups of private citizens, and those private citizens then are able to use their equipment or their, you know, their weaponry, um, and that is a, a fairly bleak history um, in this country, uh, a fairly complicated one. Um, but I'll be honest that I don't feel completely prepared to, to say too much about the corporate funding uh, before that era. I don't, I don't really think there was a whole lot of corporate funding, I and mean, I could be wrong about that, but I, it wasn't, I mean, there might have been instances of it, but it was not certainly a widespread thing where it was as common as it is now. Right. Um, and, and, you know, I think the, the overall concern that I have, and I think a lot of people have, is that you, you, you run the risk of, when it's particularly corporate entities, um, are the police going to respond faster to Chase Bank uh, calling them than Ron Daniels calling them? Um, maybe uh, in Atlanta they, they might very well do that. And that's the concern. You know, you're kind of paying for the protection. Uh, we just don't have the mobsters coming around offering the protect protection. Right. So, um, so for the most part, for the first for the first couple decades of the New York City Police uh, Foundation, it was actually the only such 
um, entity in the country. Uh, so most of the police foundations that exist today, almost all of them, started uh, in the late 90s or since. The LA uh, Police Foundation was started in 1998, around the same time as the Philadelphia Police Foundation. Um, and there's something like, uh, according to uh, the police magazines in 2011, there was about uh, dozens, you know, two or three dozen police foundations across the country, many in smaller cities and suburbs, not just in the big cities. Um, but in 2011, the, uh, the uh, uh, Justice Department, um, Target Corporation, and the New York City Police Foundation got together and created the National Police Foundations Project. And they took a tour around the country and they said, this is how you set up your own police foundation. And this is how a police foundation is going to be helpful to you to being able to get toys and, and, and gear and potentially pilot projects uh, without having to go through city councils or through public hearings um, or put your budget out there. And uh, so they went to business leaders all around the country. Um, and as of last year, uh, Lil Sis and, and Color Change put out a report on police foundations. They said something like 40% of the police foundations that were founded that still exist now, and now we're in the, the hundreds, were uh, created in 2014, in the middle of 2014, um, uh, through the end of 2016, and what happened in those two and a half, what happened in that two and a half year period, uh, that was right after the Ferguson uprising uh, in Missouri, as well as a series of other nationwide protests and uprisings across the country against specific incidents of police violence and brutality and racism um, in each in each locality. So, um, you know, so. The trade publications have started to put down tutorials. They're advocating for it very, very harshly. Uh, and business leaders then come together. And what they do is they say that we're, we're civic leaders, right? And so we're the civic leaders of a community. Uh, and we simply want to support our police. Uh, but I want to go over a little bit of who's on the police board so we know who we're talking about. Um, generally speaking, uh, most police boards uh, put up, most police foundations put up their board on their website. Um, and a number of them actually say, what are the affiliations of the people who are on it? The Atlanta one still puts up the affiliations uh, uh, of theirs. And it's just a litany of who's who of big banks, uh, private equity firms, big retail uh, firms, uh, communications and big tech, fossil fuel companies, uh, real estate firms, and uh, corporate law, law firms. There are no faith leaders. There are no labor leaders. There are no community-based organizations. So when they say civic leaders and business leaders, they just mean business leaders. And then you've, you know, you've got a series of, of police foundations that still put that on their websites. Uh, but after uh, ProPublica and, uh, and then especially Color of Change started going after police foundations and noting who was on them, a series of, of um, cities, I think it was uh, Seattle, DC, Philly, New York City, all in mid-2020, you remember the George Floyd uprising was happening right then, um, all of them scrubbed the affiliations of their boards. So they still have all the names of the board members, but, uh, but, but little sis was checking their website uh, history. And in the beginning of June or late May of 2020, they said that the, you know, this bank, this uh, target uh, in Atlanta includes Waffle House and Home Depot. Um, it's a very long list here in Atlanta, but they still include it. Uh, but those four other cities all scrubbed the affiliations. And again, it was all business leaders. And if you do the research, which Little Sis did and Color of Change did in 2022, um, you'll see that it still remains business leaders. Um, I, I do want to add one thing yeah, there, because you mentioned corporate law firms. And I think it's important to, Not all um, well, no, I think it's important to, right. to let people know that um, corporate law firms are usually do a, a wide array of legal work, but usually you don't see anybody there that does criminal defense work. And if they do, it's right. usually internal investigations or white collar criminal defense. I think it's very important to note that because, right. um, you know, uh, you, you would think a criminal defense lawyer would might be a good person to have on a police foundation, but and, and at the same time, I mean, I think you know when we talk about crime and criminality, which is always at the center of discourse around policing, right? We're always talking about poor people and the crimes that are committed by poor people. We're never talking about the crimes committed by Wells Fargo when they created millions of fake accounts of their own account holders 
to, to inflate their profits and then got caught d doing, engaging in this massive amount of fraud that, that you know, affected people's credit scores. This is about 2016, 2017. Um, that's a form of crime, but, that, but Wells Fargo is on the board of the Atlanta Police Foundation uh, and is a, is a funder of a number of others. A number of the other companies, uh, and when I talk about communications companies, it's, it's worthwhile to mention, are actually companies that also have bids um, or have interests in, in getting pilot programs up in front of uh, police foundations and in front of police departments. So Motorola, uh, ViewView, View, um, and then there's, a, there's a series of others uh, that have all kind of IBM, Dintec, uh, MTX, have all donated to police foundations when they wanted police departments to consider them for a contract. There was a, a mandate in 2014 or 2013 um, by the courts in New York City that New York City police needed to use body cams. So, uh, so two firms came in and said, we're going to donate a whole bunch of body cams um, to the police foundation, which are then going to be donated on to the police. And now the police had 80 uh, body cams, but they needed tens of thousands. So they opened up the corporate you know, bids. They had open bids. And the, uh, they had dozens of companies come in and bid. But the two finalists were the two donors to the police foundation, Motorola and Vivio. And Vivio was the one who won the, the contract. Motorola has also won contracts with the LA police foundation, uh, with the LAPD, through donating um, equipment to the LA uh, Police Foundation, and then, uh, and then you know, it moves on to uh, the LAPD, and then uh, they suddenly have a contract because they already have the technology. Somebody's got to pay for it, and plus, it's proven, right? They have a, they've got the pilot program for a communication center, thanks to Motorola, so it's proven. And then you got to replace it, you got to maintain it, you got to repair it, and it keeps going back to those people. Right. So. Um, I, I, specifically as a, as a staffer on EFF, I've, I've got to go through some of these examples um, and then, uh, then kind of talk, I think we can talk a little bit about like accountability and stuff. And I yeah. think you've got some other examples. Do you want to go through examples first together? No, we can okay. we, we go one, one after the yeah. other. So, I mean, I have too many of these. Uh, you know, Atlanta, uh, the Atlanta Police Foundation, by the way, is the second largest, uh, well, you know, most well-funded in the country. Um, it is uh, significantly more well-funded than the LA Police Foundation. The Chicago Police Foundation is actually pretty weak, surprisingly. Uh, and so the Atlanta Police Foundation, I, you know, they ha uh, funded Operation Shield. Maybe some of y'all who are from Atlanta may know that Atlanta has per capita the largest number of cameras, private cameras, um, that are connected to a surveillance network in the country. Uh, and then uh, the Atlanta Police Foundation, uh, this is about 11,000 as of two years ago anyway, um, then they, they uh, went further and the Atlanta Police Foundation uh, has funded the creation of an attempt at predictive policing using connections between the, the camera network and license plate reader uh, networks as well. Um, and predictive policing, if you don't know, is where police go around and increase their number of interactions with people who haven't committed crimes, but who they're on their data they claim may be more likely to commit a crime, even if you've never committed one in your life. So, um, you know, they, the, the Atlanta Police Foundation also has funded uh, license plate readers. Uh, the uh, probably most well-known thing lately that they have funded is they, they actually have the lease on the land um, in the uh, southwest side of the city uh, where Cop City is being built. Um, and they are fitting the bill, last I knew, for about two-thirds of the $90 million bill for this massive training facility, which I was born in Atlanta. I'm from the north, though, let's be truthful. But the truth is, that this is going to be a training facility for people from all over the country, and there are going to be actually international uh, law enforcement agencies that are also going to be getting training there. So uh, it's both corporations that are coming from outside of Atlanta that are funding and sitting on the board of the Atlanta Police Foundation, and it's also going to be law enforcement uh, across the country who are going to be getting trained there. So somebody like me still has a, has a lot of reason to be paying attention to it because my cops are going to be being trained there too from, from up north. Um, the, uh, you know, among other things, Philadelphia, Atlanta, Louisville, and, and Houston all uh, purchased military SWAT equipment, including drones uh, for their police, uh, police departments. Again, when, you know, if, if a, in most places, if a police department wants to acquire drones, they have to go through a public process. And there is the possibility that that public process may include a lot of public comment and people may come back in opposition to it. So um, 
I have a huge number of other examples, but I think we can move on a little bit from them, and I can always jump back to them. But a lot of it is around surveillance equipment, the stuff that we pay attention to. And uh, according to the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Foundation, they did a little research on 58 of their, their sibling uh, foundations. They found that 76% of it was for tech and tech-based equipment. And that didn't include gunshot detection equipment, which is, in my opinion, another form of, of tech. Um, they also found that 14% were for weapons, and many of those, again, are for more higher power uh, SWAT weapons, not you know just your you know uh, your service uh, pistol or something like that. But but and 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 for tasers, and it's important that Axon, which is the the owner of the tasers, uh, has donated to police foundations you know, dozens at a time of tasers to, that then go into the police department and there's your pilot program and now Axon has a, has a no bid contract or a low bid contract to, to, uh, to fill, fulfill an order for tasers for that entire uh, police department. Um, so, you know, again, I think that a lot of this uh, is, it, what it does is it reduces transparency. It means that we don't actually have access to the numbers. Um, we don't actually have access to wh where the what, the, what the donations are, who exactly is making the donation for what specific product, and how it's entering police departments um, in a way that we can do a public records request to the police department. Now, police departments don't always answer public records request. New York Police Department is notorious for not, uh, where, where I, I live, my whole family lives up in Brooklyn. Um, New York Police Department are notorious for refusing or, or ignoring uh, records requests. But there's still a possibility. That's a mechanism still for trying to get some of the information. And if they refuse, we can take them to court. Right, and EFF has taken you know the the LA Police Department to court and uh, some other departments, mostly in California, um, over this. Uh, Lucy Parsons Labs has taken Chicago Police and, and uh, the Atlanta Police um, to to court over this. Stop uh, a group in in New York um, has tried similar things in New York City, uh, but we can't do that with a police foundation. So the question in part is how do we, how do we take what the accountability and the transparency that we can assert over a city council budget or a budget request that is made to the city council by a police department and how do we, uh, how do we you know, open up these police foundations? In New York City, they did pass legislation that said that um, the police commission has to approve uh, 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 you know, budget requests. Uh, there are a couple of other cities that have done similar things so that there is, or, or not budget requests, uh, gifts, private gifts from the police foundations. Um, and there is an attempt in New York City uh, just this year to open up all gifts from the New York City Police Foundation that are given to the New York City Police Department which would be a bonanza, right, at least for transparency. It doesn't necessarily mean that these, these uh, tools are not going to end up in a police department's hands if communities don't approve of that. But it does at least give, give some, uh, some kind of uh, information to communities to, to help organize and at least know how they're being surveilled, right, how they're being watched and what kinds of weapons police have. Um, so uh, I, have a, I have a lot more to say, but I think that that's, that's a big part of what we can do is a little bit of municipal and sometimes state level legislation to open up police foundations. Some groups are trying to take them to the courts to try to argue that if you are taking all of these, if you're taking a lot of money in, all for the police department and you're sending to tools to the police department and you're creating projects for the police department, for example, Operation uh, Shield, which the Atlanta Police Foundation still administers, um, or Cop City, which the, the Atlanta Police Foundation still owns the lease on, that the pr this private entity is a uh, government actor. And if it's acting as a government actor, then it needs to have the same kinds of transparency requirements that a government agency would have. Um, so. Uh, that's some of it. Uh, I'm sure we can get into a lot of Q&A on that question, and I'll turn it over yeah. to Ron for now. And, and so I kind of want to hit on the, some of the transparency issues, too. And, and I, I think the important thing is it's not necessarily the money that's a transparency issue. It's when the police foundations give police departments technology or equipment. Um, at least when they give them money, you see... Uh, in their budgets that they got X number of dollars from a police foundation. Um, is that the most fulsome, transparent thing in the world? No. Uh, but it's far better than a line item saying technology X number of dollars, um, and you know that they got 
body cams from ViewView or Motorola. Um, so in terms of transparency, money would be better than them getting just equipment from these police foundations. But, um, you know, the problem is whether or not a police foundation is, in fact, a government actor or a quasi-governmental entity. And, it, for instance, in Georgia, you – you could file as many lawsuits as you want to. You're not going to get them to be deemed a quasi-governmental actor where they're subject to open records. Um, our law is just not uh, geared to where that would be a reasonable outcome. Should it be? Yes. Um, you know, that's ultimately the problem is, and, and I've mentioned it before, is you people giving money, your concern is always, are police going to respond to everybody the same way? And two, what, what are they getting? Uh, it doesn't you know, it's not really shocking that some of the technology they get benefits uh, people like Target, who give them lots of money. Um, you know, uh, I, you, you brought up Cop City, and it, I have to bring it up because it's been on the news for the last two weeks. I think a lot of people learned a lot about the Fulton County Jail in the last two weeks and how bad the conditions are there, yet we're building a massive training center uh, here in Fulton County uh, for the Atlanta Police Department and other police departments around the, the world through through the, the foundation. But yet you've got a jail that really ought to be shut down because the conditions are so bad. Um, is that the right use of money? Is that the right use of uh, resources for law enforcement? Law enforcement exists. I, I appreciate the, the <laughs> cynicism um, in, in your hypothesis you started with, but... Uh, just to take the, the sort of the counter position that law enforcement exists to enforce the laws that we all mutually agreed upon uh, that we are going to abide by. Um, and that means they work for us. Um, and, you know, that in theory, right. in theory, okay? Uh, and in theory, that means we ought to have some sort of input in how they're spending money they get, whether it's from our tax dollars uh, that we are all so excited to pay in. Um, no matter how little or how much we make, we are just thrilled to pay taxes. Uh, or, you know, if they're getting it from private companies. Uh, now, in Georgia, you, you can actually, as a citizen, because we have a law, our legislature passed a law, you can give money directly to police foundations that is tax deductible. Um, it does not work quite like some of the other mechanisms they've set up for that uh, for instance you can fund rural hospitals in Georgia which is a great idea and your money actually counts twice uh, it can decrease your income for purposes of your t federal taxes uh, and decrease your your state income tax liability it's it's kind of neat uh, and you know hospitals, not legal advice yeah not legal <laughs> advice uh, you have to apply to get in the program uh, you can't do that with the police foundations it, it doesn't decrease your tax liability in the same way but it does offset what your state tax liability would be um and so you know the, the funding mechanism for these things really are what interests me is because you know these private companies um you know I, i'm i don't think the problem is places where i live um i think the problems are probably more likely places like atlanta chicago la new york city uh you know in a town of seven thousand people um we don't have a whole lot of big industries contributing money to our police force to get LPRs, for instance, to outfit all the cars. License plate readers, yeah. right? Um, which, personally, I'll tell you, I think LPRs are one of the worst things in the world. Terrible. Um, it, you know, no, no law enforcement officer can read a tag that fast and read that many tags in that small amount of time. Uh, and I don't think we all agreed for a computer to enforce the laws for us. I think it's a very dangerous slope, but um, you know, that's that technology that we worry about that they're getting. One, one addendum to that, though, is that, for example, the Atlanta Police Foundation has put millions of dollars into Buckhead. Yeah. So they're, you know, uh, sometimes there are smaller suburbs or towns with police foundations, but also some of the big police foundations are funding, especially in the wealthier suburbs. I mm -hmm. think Buckhead's a, a wealthier um, part of the, the metro area. Uh, they're, they're funding, you know, LPRs and uh, surveillance technology in those communities as well for people who are coming in and out. Uh, which is to say, working class people who may be going in and out of of a wealthier mm -hmm. suburb. And, and you know, I mean, it, that that's ultimately the problem is that it. I may be down in Middle Georgia. I, I may never have to worry about any of my law enforcement agencies there, uh, having this sort of money. But I'm here in Atlanta, 
Uh, I come to Atlanta for the last year. I came about six to ten times a month. I mean, on a normal basis, I come at least a couple of times every other month. Um, you know, I, I go through these places, and that's the thing. We, we are a mobile people. Um, you may not have to worry about uh, the, the city police of a town of 200 people uh, having all this technology, but you're here in Atlanta, um, everybody in this room. You're in Atlanta. You, you've, you've been subjected to surveillance, uh, whether you knew it or not, um, that was funded by a private company. Um, right, right. At the end of the day. So, I mean, that, it affects everybody regardless of where you live. Uh, w one other thing I want to touch on real um, uh, well one other thing I want to touch on real quick and stuff and then we'll get to that question right there that uh, free press um, person right there uh, is that you know police foundations have other roles as well and one of them is often as kind of a private sector public relations firm for the police so after uh, Black Lives Matter protests in a number of parts of the country it was police foundations along with union with police unions in many places that organized the rallies uh, in support of the police and against Black Lives Matter which you know in theory you could protest for police without protesting against Black Lives Matter but that doesn't ever seem to happen. But regardless, I, I'll point to a specific case of this kind of thing. Um, in Austin, uh, Texas, the police, uh, you know, got defeated in a, a terrible lawsuit over their their conduct in 2020 after the the um, protests after the George Floyd uprising, and uh, they had not been allowed to use license plate readers, uh, which Ron was just talking about. So they came back to the city council and they said, "We want to be able to use um, license plate readers." Last year. And uh, they kept pushing back uh, the vote in city council because droves of community members came out and they weren't brought by any big funder and nobody told them to come, nobody paid them to come. And I, you know, I participated a little bit in this, I paid attention to it. Uh, it you know, these were grassroots community members who didn't want license plate readers all across Austin, Texas. But by the third or fourth city, uh, hall, city council meeting in Austin, suddenly there was about one to nine um, of the speakers were now in support of the license plate readers and it turned out that every single one of the speakers who was in favor of the license plate readers in Austin at the, t at the City Council was affiliated with the Austin Police Foundation. So they play this key role, at, you know, I don't know if you want to talk about Crime Stoppers and, and stuff, but, there's, <laughs> yeah. but they play this key role in kind of promoting police also in the community and in playing a role in being a voice in the way that the police department might not be able to on its own um, alongside police unions, uh, the Fraternal Order of Police or others, um, in support of whatever the police is pushing for, whatever a police department's pushing for. Who, who in here has seen a Crime Stoppers commercial? I mean, m most everybody. Um, so the basic idea is, hey, there's these crimes out there. If you have information, uh, call it in and leave it on the tip line, and you might get some money as a reward. Um, Usually that's funded through police foundations or some sort of private organization that's not affiliated with the police. Same with the, the arson cases. You know, sometimes you'll see $10,000 for information relating to the arrest of the person who committed this arson, things like that. It's always a private uh, entity that puts up that money. Um, there are a lot of people out there who will need money and may have some facts, uh, but may, we'll use the word embellish. <laughs> um, and you know, we, I, I'll, I'll say this, is our justice system perfect? No, it is not perfect. Is it a lot better than many of the alternatives? Yes. Um, do juries sometimes get things wrong? Yes. Um, their juries are made of people. Um, people are fallible. We make mistakes. Um, and sometimes juries convict people when they shouldn't. Um, I, I've had clients that I didn't think should be convicted. I've had clients that I thought should be convicted. Um, I, I can't tell you who, but, you know, um, you know that, that's just the thing. It's, you put 12 people in the box, as we say, in the jury box, and, and let them go. Well, if you have information from somebody that wanted a reward, you're incentivizing them to say something, you have to worry about their credibility because you have financially incentivized them to 
essentially give evidence against somebody. And it doesn't always work out. Um, you know, most of the people that are just completely throwing spaghetti at the wall, they weed those people out. They don't get any money. Uh, but you hear plenty of times where people may or may not actually have reliable information, uh, but they heard through the grapevine or they have enough information that they can give to somebody. And it could, in theory, lead a jury to convict somebody that may or may not um, be innocent. But at at the same time, that that is the burden that they have to bear as jurors. Um, that's up, you know, that's for them to determine. But the idea of a, a private company um, offering money rewards, uh, it just is. It, it's never really set well to me because there is no transparency. We have a question, and anytime anybody has a question, just come on down the microphone. We, we should too. start yeah. with. We should yeah, start we, with this free press. There. Yeah. Uh, we have a, we have a free, we have one over here, and then we'll come to you. Yeah. If you want to start. James, I'm local. Um, sorry, I may have misunderstood. You were suggesting, uh, Jose, that there might be questions specifically about Cop City? Um, c questions from the audience? We're, we, they, we actually have a Cop City uh, panel tomorrow, um, which I'll also be on. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to take them now, and I'm happy to take them then. Um, you said the Atlanta Police Foundation is the second largest in the country. Uh, second largest in terms of funding. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was I thought it was loud enough. Um, about the APF being the second largest in the country, uh, funding wise, is that a recent development? Has that is that civil rights era? Is that right now funding Cop City era, or is it uh, coincidence? The the um so, if if I do a meticulous check on ProPublica, they they have been very good about having all of the police foundation numbers um, from you know a series of different cities. They don't go nearly to all of the several hundred of them that now exist, uh, but. The 2022 report by Little Sis, um, in which they went back, and, and Color Change, where they went back and looked at 28, uh, 2018 through 2020, um, they, you know, kind of cut up how uh, the biggest police foundations, um, how much money they have coming in, and then some of the gifts and some of uh, what the gifts look like. And Atlanta uh, is uh, very, very, very high up, um, significantly above uh, any other city except for New York, because mm -hmm. uh, New York's number one. I was asking about the timeline, although if it, this is not... Yeah, as far as I, I you know, th this is a study that goes back to 2018, mm -hmm. um, and I couldn't tell you before that, but the Atlanta Police Foundation's been around for long enough, and a lot of the other police foundations were only founded in the 2010s. Chicago's was, you know, founded in 2012, I want to say, um, and I think, you know, like I said, 40% of all the police foundations that currently exist came within the two years after uh, the Ferguson uprising in 2014. So, you know... I don't know about 2010, but um, but I would I would hazard to guess since there weren't that many that existed, uh, the Atlanta Police Foundation had already started working on its camera network, um, had already started uh, uh, spreading the cameras around by 2013 um, at the at the latest. Uh, so I would hazard to guess that it it was one of the biggest and well most well funded at least a decade ago as well. Thank you. But it, you know, I mean, I could certainly Jose at EFF org if you want to uh, check, you know, my work, or if you want me to check my work. Hey, thanks for doing this panel. Um, one call to action first, and then a question. So the call to action is: there's a website called CopCityVote.com. If you are a resident of the city of Atlanta, if you're a voter here, please uh, sign the petition to get it on the uh, referendum on the ballot for next election, which would stop the funding for Cop City. Uh, so there, there was a city council meeting on June 5th. If you want to watch a really interesting 10 and a half hour YouTube video, uh, there was a two minute limit on people speaking, but that entire time is filled up with person after person testifying on how Cop City would affect them. Uh, really amazing. It, it, it's very inspiring to watch. Unfortunately, of course, at the end, they still voted for the cop city funding to go through. Uh, the city council did. Um, so that's why this ballot uh, initiative is so important. Um, my question is uh, around police foundations and also police unions kind of nationally driving a narrative about crime being out of control or surging. Uh, it seems like very much a pattern, and I want to understand like whether this is an organized activity. Uh, I'm from San Francisco. There's a huge narrative nationally about San Francisco being a hellhole city, 
those of us who live there are kind of like, well, I mean, yes, crime is a problem just like in any other major American city, but it's actually much better than this narrative is trying to make clear. Um, in January, Walgreens had to admit that they had lied about uh, how much uh, shoplifting was a problem in their stores. They just needed excuses to close unprofitable branches. Um, so I just want to ask, you know, whether you know that there's any kind of organized activity around driving this narrative. Uh, the, the short answer is certainly. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I watch city council, you know, hearings all over the country, and, and I go to them in, in the cities that I've lived in. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I can, you know, quickly give the example um, with, for example, the license plate readers in Austin. There was a similar situation with license plate readers in Portland. Um, the, the, on the one hand, the people who came from the police foundation uh, and the police uh, chief uh, when they came to say we need the license plate readers, all of the information, all of the needs that they said that they had for these license plate readers were, um, were anecdotal, right? And it was fear-mongering anecdotal stuff. It was, you know, really like trafficking. In the past, of course, they have coordinated other narratives. In the 90s and the 80s, it would have been drugs. In the 2000s, it, might, it would have been terrorism. And that's when we see the fusion center, you know, boom across the country. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, after that was no longer palatable, right? People, they, they, they turned to violent crime at one point. Um, and, that, and then they, they started saying, well, it's rioting and, and trafficking and child trafficking and, and human trafficking. Um, but they, you know, this was all anecdotal, and, and it was a lot of people kind of coming with hypotheticals. Well, this could happen, but they didn't have stories to point back to. However, when the Austin police chief was, was asked by the city council members, well, give us the data on, you know, you're, you're saying that there is trafficking, you're saying that there is light, people are stealing license plates, or that people are stealing, you know, uh, parts of cars, and this is why you need license plate readers. The Austin police chief said, I don't have to give you the data. And he didn't, enter, he didn't give them any data. So, you know, on the question of like, is it, is it a nation, national, conver, you know, national thing? Yeah, well, they have, uh, we have progressive publications that sometimes give arguments and then people take those arguments to their city councils. That kind of thing happens on the other side as well. There are police publications, there are police foundation publications that are national. And just like they're um, giving you a tutorial on how to organize your own police foundation, they're also kind of giving talking points on, you know, uh, how to argue in favor of more police technology. Um, you know, they, they also, I mean, there's a police chief's conference every year. Uh, the police unions are, are nationwide. They, they each send out talking points just as much as if, you know, a progressive national organization might send talking points to their partners who are unpaid. In these cases, they're, they can send out talking points to people who are very well paid or who are at least family members of people who are in the, the um, department or maybe in the police foundation. Um, so at minimum, I would say, it absolutely is happening in that kind of way. And you can track it. I mean, if, if you really want to track it, you can track it by city council meetings over the decades because the arguments that they make for these technologies are changing. They change with the times. You know, I will, I will say, though, this. If, if the goal is to reduce certain types of crime or to reduce crime, I mean, look at Atlanta. If we have the, the second most well-funded uh, police foundation, look at the murder rate in Atlanta. I mean, look at the violent crime rate in Atlanta. Um, if, if, that's the, if that's what the end result of these foundations are, is to reduce crime or things like that, I, I don't know that they're very effective at doing it. I will also say this. I, I, I don't know proportionally that crime is any more prevalent than it would have been 200 years ago. Um, we have a lot more people. Um, so proportionally, I don't know that we have some massive spike in the number of crimes being committed to the number of people that are now inhabiting a space. Um, what I think we do absolutely have is, is more information about crime. Uh, and we hear about it because you can't turn on a television or pick up your phone without getting some news alert about the worst thing that's happened today. Um, and, you know, what the correlation that has to everything, I don't, I don't know. But, I mean, I, I ultimately don't know that, that we're solving a lot of the, the, the crime that you're talking about 
uh, that that causes places to get a bad name. I don't know that we're solving that with police foundations. Right. I, th I think that's an important point. I think, you know, when you look at, you know, uh, crime rates, that's a very difficult question because if cannabis is illegal in one decade but it's not illegal in another decade, then crime's going to look like it went down, right? Um, but on the other hand, if you look at, you know, violent crime rates, well, you know, if somebody has been murdered, in theory at least, you know, their body's going to show up and that murder is going to be known one way or the other, whether the police are apprehending people or filing a report or not. Um, but, uh, you know, in the, in the decades of my life, the, 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 the crime rate has gone up and it has gone back down and it has gone up and it has gone back down and police funding has increased consistently. The number of law enforcement by most, uh, in most departments has increased consistently. Uh, and the number of beds in, in, uh, in prisons and jails has consistently increased as well. Um, up until about eight years ago, uh, the incarceration rate had just been increasing since the, since the early 70s. So, uh, you know, to the tune of about 15, 12 to 15 million arrests per year of our fellow countrymen. Like, if we don't support totalitarianism in another country, why do we support 15 million people getting put in cages every every year? Um, but that's that's besides the point. I probably should have covered EFF for that one. Um, we've got a, a question in the back and then a question in the front. Uh, yeah, my name's Steve. I'm uh, from Chattanooga, Tennessee. And uh, less than a month ago, we had the formation of the very first Chattanooga Police Foundation. Um, and I didn't know if you could recommend any strategies for either monitoring or countering uh, the influence of such organizations. Yeah, I mean, you know, some of that, there's, uh, there are some really um, strong activists in Nashville um, who have been doing it, so there might be some good communication, in part because Tennessee, uh, Tennessee, I forget if it is one of the states where, in order, for example, to do a public records request, you have to be a resident of the state. Um, Alabama's like that. I think Tennessee might be. Um, and, and then Tennessee also has very strong restrictions, I think, on, on if municipalities can, for example, lower funding to the police. So if the police funding goes up, it's just up. That's true in Texas. That's true in a number of other states. Um, and of course, you know, the police foundations then can s still offer an auxiliary role. Um, so I would, I would point a little bit towards uh, Nashville. I also would point towards myself. I'm happy to help out in such a case because uh, at EFF, we have the Electronic Frontier Alliance, with e which EF Georgia is a member of. Um, and it is a network of local groups across the country um, that are doing kind of tech oriented stuff. It's not all around policing. Um, I tend to focus on some of the policing and labor issues, but we have other folks who are working on other stuff. So, you know, feel free to contact us and we can see what we can do to, to at least support that work. But it's going to be, diff I mean, the truth is it's going to be difficult. And, and, and as far as I know in Tennessee in particular, it'll be difficult. The folks in Nashville, I'd love to get you in touch with though. Uh, hello, uh, my name's Thomas uh, and I live line of sight from Cop City here in Atlanta. Um, my question is, are there any practical limits on what these foundations can uh, provide to police departments? Because I'm thinking, if I'm a large corporate donor and I want to really curry favor with the police, how nakedly corrupt can I be? Can I decide that every member of the Atlanta police force gets a Rolex? Right. Well, that's, that's actually what, I mean, you may know this, but that's exactly what the Atlanta Police Foundation did. After the killing of Rayshard Brooks, which uh, people considered to, many people in Atlanta considered to have been a murder um, by the police, the, uh, you know, the, uh, there was there was an attempt to call for accountability. The Atlanta Police Department um, officers engaged in uh, a, a, a I think they called it a blue flu or something to that effect, where they um, you know were getting very angry at the possibility of accountability. I don't think there was any accountability, but the Atlanta Police Foundation turned around and gave every single one of them five hundred dollars. Every single officer in the city of five hundred dollars as a little bonus after having killed a man, and then after uh, opposing any possibility of accountability so uh, but in terms of the limitation the the limit is actually state state. How, how how much of a tax deduction they can they can get I mean that that's really the limit um, you know it, it, there's no statutory limits uh, at least not in Georgia uh, yeah I would I would imagine that's a state-by-state state thing but I don't know any states where uh, where I know a single limitation like that we have a question back there uh, where's Waldo there's Waldo. Excuse me. 
reach. Hey, uh, I'm Sam from Chicago. You're Waldo. Also, I'm Waldo. Chicago. That's just my day job. But. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, kind of on the topic of that last question, and while well, I'm sure this varies by city and region, what do you think has been worse for police accountability between police foundations and police unions? <sighs> Well, I mean, police unions have a much longer history, right? I think, I think that part of it would be that police unions have a very, are very strong in Chicago, among many other places, uh, whereas the police foundation, as far as I know from, from Chicago activists that I, that I uh, talk to a lot, um, is, is not one of the strongest, surprisingly to me, uh, uh, police foundations. So police unions have a very strong capacity, at least historically, to say that A, uh, you know, Things that uh, misconduct by police departments should be the liability of the city rather than you know, individual officers or the department, um, and have protected officers in one case after another um, of very clear torture or murder. Uh, find a police union that has actually uh, singled out an incident where uh, police misconduct is alleged to have taken place, where they say, yes, this misconduct took place. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll sell you a, a bridge in Brooklyn. I mean, it's, it just doesn't happen. So, um, so I, I would say historically, police unions, I'd probably, you know, hazard to guess. Uh, and certainly there are a lot of folks in the labor movement that have been seeking to, to disaffiliate from the, the police unions um, or, or, or suggest that the police unions don't have a place in the, the larger union federations because, for example, uh, Alabama police were the ones who were, were um, supporting strike breakers at, at the, the Warrior Met uh, strike um, where coal miners in, the, in the, the mine workers union were on strike for years. Uh, the police were consistently on the side of the lawbreakers, meaning the, the mining companies, um, and not on the side of the workers, right? So that's a pretty consistent thing. I mean, when you look at strikes across the country, when you, when you look at picket lines across the country, police are usually f focused on their fellow workers. I don't think that police are workers. I think police are managers um, and, and should be thought of as management. Uh, they're just management in our neighborhoods rather than our workplaces. And I'm, I I'm, cover I'm, up the EFF for that one too. <laughs> I, I don't know that I think either one is inherently a bad thing. I think it it all depends on the execution. Um, you know, the idea of a police union in and of itself is not an inherently bad idea. The idea of a police foundation in and of itself is not an inherently bad idea. It's how they are carried out. And I think it all goes back to accountability, transparency, and trust, and whether you can trust those organizations. Um, you know, I, I would differ. I think law enforcement officers are, they're, they're employees of somebody. I mean, I, I don't think that their, their, their rights as employees should be able to be discounted. Um, you know, so, I mean, I, I don't know that a police union in and of itself is a terrible concept, and I don't know that in and of itself a police foundation is a terrible concept. It's just when they do things that, and they frequently do things that we don't like and that we don't have any sort of accountability for them, that we have these discussions where we decide that we don't like them. And so, I, and I'm not meaning just to equivocate on the question, but I, I don't know that you could sit there and say that one is consistently worse than the other. I think it's something you just got to look at each of them and in, in each place that they're at and, and the space they're in to figure out which one's worse in that space. Should we be concerned considering the surveillance part of policing of uh, a possibility where uh, you might be in a state where it's illegal or you pass through a state where it's illegal for you to do something like say right. buy marijuana or support someone who might be right. needing uh, uh, right. well, birth control pills and then the police might yeah. be surveillancing you to that spot committing the crime in your state or along the way and then they enforcing the law when you come back. They, you know, in California, for example, there's state level legislation and there are city council legislations in support of sanctuary cities for, for undocumented immigrants, for gender affirming care, for, um, for abortion access. 
and they specifically say we're not going to give information to states that are seeking uh, uh, information on anybody who might be crossing state lines for, say, gender-affirming care and abortion access. But, uh, there, you know, EFF has, has uh, investigated some of this, and there have been a number of police departments in, uh, and fusion centers in California that have spread that information, have, have offered that information up. In Austin, Texas, again, they, they have said we're a sanctuary city. We are a city. They have passed you know, ordinances and resolutions at the city council level that says that we are a city that protects abortion access. We're a city that uh, protects gender affirming care. However, when they put up those license plate readers uh, and they have a fusion center in Austin that is connected to the state law enforcement agencies, and that data goes into the fusion center, they're just spreading it right to the state authorities. So any attempt that they say uh, to, to, to say that any data collected in Austin by Austin police is not going to be used for these types of things, it, it's baloney. Right? It goes straight to the state uh, troopers, to the, to, sorry, the Texas Rangers. We're supposed to call them the Texas Rangers, right? Um, it goes straight to the Texas Rangers for, for those investigations. And then it gets, it gets a little bit murkier because if you want to, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a complicated uh, conversation, um, but it gets, you know, to a murkier place because if, uh, if a state law enforcement agency or another state uh, or a separate state wants to go to, say, California or to Austin, Texas, um, they may simply be uh, looking, you know, investigating homicides. They may not say what kind of homicides they're investigating, um, for example, or they may say that they're investigating child abuse. They may not say what kind of what they are encompassing as child abuse. It may be gender affirming care by parents. It may be abortion. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's clearly already happening. Um, the data is being collected in places where they claim they are not criminalizing things, and then they are just shipping that data on to the agencies and the states where, uh, where they are, uh, in fact, criminalizing those things. And, and just so I can lob a, a grenade in here at the last second, <laughs> uh, the, the other corollary to that is, too, you may get uh, be driving through another state. You may be a resident of Georgia where we have constitutional carry, and uh, LPR may flag that you have a, a carry permit for a pistol and you may get pulled over because it's illegal to have a pistol there and they want to see if you got your pistol in your right. car. So, I mean, it, it, it's not just some issues. There, there's a lot of issues that can pop Agreed. So, um, and that's time. Yeah, and that's time. So thank you very much. You can uh, reach out to me at jose at EFF.org. Uh, if you have a local group anywhere in the country that you think works on tech issues or police surveillance or other issues, feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to talk to you about affiliation um, or at least what we can do to support some of your local campaigns. Uh, and uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. And don't forget to rate the panel in the DragonCon app. Sure. Um, uh, even if you, you hate us, um, uh, leave, gonna, leave comments. I'm going to cosplay for my first time this year, so help me get back to, to DragonCon next year so I can cosplay a little bit better. Yeah.